one line at a time. Haribo. You okay, Maharaj. Let okay, us also okay, chant Maharaj. it with you. Okay, Maharaj. Sorry, Maharaj. Sorry, Maharaj. Okay. Yashmin Sarvani Bhutani. Yashmin Sarvani Bhutani. Atmaiva Bhutti Janata. Atmaiva Bhutti Janata. Tatrako Mohaka Soka. Tatrako Mohaka Soka. Okay, would, would someone else like to chant? Uh, Maharaj, I would like to chant. Go ahead. Okay. Yasmin Sawani Bhutani. Yasmin Sawani Bhutani. Atmai Babut Vijanataha Atmai Babut Vijanataha Tatrako Mohaka Soka Tatrako Mohaka Soka Ekatwanupashataha Okay, Rukmini Pati Prabhu, you can read translation. Hey One who always sees all living entities as spiritual sparks, in quality one with the Lord, becomes a true knower of things. What then can be illusion or anxiety for him? Okay, so we're hearing about this kind of spiritual vision. Spiritual vision. Seeing all living entities. Not seeing them as, bo as bodies, not just seeing the body, but seeing the spiritual spark and seeing it in quality, one with the Lord. In this way, you're a, a true knower of things. What then can be illusion or anxiety for him? Okay, go ahead, Prabhu. Purpur. Yes, Prabhu, Rukmini Pati Prabhu. Oh, yes, Maharaj. Sorry, Maharaj. I just unmuted. Uh, except for the Madhyama Adhikari and Uttama Adhikari discuss above, no one can correctly see the spiritual position of a living being. The living entities are qualitatively one with the Supreme Lord. Just as the spark of a fire are qualitatively one with the fire, yet sparks are not fire as far as quantity is concerned. For the quantity of heat and light present in the spark is not equal to that in fire. The Mahabhagavata, the great devotee, sees oneness in the sense that he sees everything as the energy of the Supreme Lord. Since there is no difference between the energy and the energetic there is the sense of oneness. Although from the analytical point of view, heat and light are different from fire, there is no meaning to the word fire without heat and light. In synthesis, therefore, heat, light and fire are the same. Okay, would you like to explain to us what Prabhupada is talking? Maybe you can explain first of all, what is a Madhyam Adhikari and an Uttama Adhikari? Sure, Maharaj. The Madhyam Adhikari is a... Uh, 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 who can actually uh, 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 also argue with non devotees and say the facts about Krishna consciousness or what? About what spiritual life and uh, uh, he is uh, he is one step higher than the Anista Adigari and uh, 
is one step lower than the Uttama Adhikari. Uh, what is the Kanista Adhikari? What is an Uttama Adhikari? I don't know. Kanista Adhikari is a neophyte, Maharaj. And uh, Madhyama Adhikari is, is uh, someone who, who knows better than the Kanista Adhikari on, on spiritual Vedas. And Uttama Adhikari is the highest who are liberated souls, uh, who sees everyone equally without uh, differentiating them differently. Whereas the Madhyama Adhikari has not come to that stage yet. <laughs> I'm just trying, Maharaj. Okay. So. Someone else like to tell us what, what is Kanista Adhikari? How does he think? How does he view everything? Yes. Uh, Kanista Adhikari, they think that God is only present at temple. Okay. They think God's in the temple only. Yeah. And Kanista Adhikari, they are quite materialistic. Okay. Whereas uh, Madhyama Adhikari, they know how to differentiate between the four kinds of people, the Supreme Lord, the devotees, the innocent, and the atheist. How does, how do, how does the Madhyama Adhikari relate to these different people? Uh, for the Supreme Lord, the Madhyama Adhikari, they offer their obeisances to the Supreme Lord. Offer as for the only offer obeisances. They serve the Supreme Lord. Okay, they will worship the Supreme Lord, mm -hmm. right? They will worship yes. the Lord. They will offer obeisances. They will, yeah, they will do all kinds of service for the pleasure of the Lord in the in the temple. Okay. What about other people? The, the devotees, they, uh, they converse about Krishna. Mm -hmm. They will and, a, a, associate together yeah. and enlighten, yes. enlighten each other and converse about Krishna. Yes. Yes. Okay. And? And as for the innocent, those who have no knowledge in spiritual thing, they try to share Krishna Consciousness with them. Yeah, they try to give mercy to the innocent, right? Yes. They try to bring them, because the innocent, they're not going to argue. The innocent people, maybe they have questions, they're coming to inquire. They would like to know. So the Madhya Madhikari will talk to them and encourage them, try to help them. You know, make them feel at home, make them feel friendly, and try to teach them how to take up bhakti yoga. Okay, what about the fourth class people? As for the atheist, uh, Matema Adhikari devotees, they try to stay away from the atheist to give them mercy also. Yes, they neglect them, right? Why? Because when we are around the atheists, the atheists will get angry when looking at the devotees. So the more they get angry, the more offences they commit. Right. The more offences they commit. So it doesn't, it's not good for them, right? To commit offences. Yes. So better just leave them. And when they're, when they're ready, if, if maybe in the future, maybe they'll come. So. What about these Kanista people? You know, what, what is their nature? They see God in the temple. What, can you say anything about their behavior? They do not know how to differentiate between devotees and non-devotees. Yes. And they also quarrel 
they often argue and quarrel with one another. Remember, I said Kali Yuga, the nature of Kali Yuga. People argue and quarrel with each other over different issues, never satisfied, always complaining. And so this is the Kanista tendency to find fault, to criticize and complain. But the Madhyama devotee, he, does he do like that? No. What's he doing? What does the Madhyam devotee do? Talk to devotees, make friends with them. Yeah, make a, have friends, friendly dealings with the devotee, and they, they they preach, they go for preaching, they go and they they're always busy doing service, and they see the good qualities in other devotees. They're always praising the other devotees. Oh, such a good devotee. You know, there, there's that one deity in South India. I don't remember the name of the deity, but anyway, it's a famous deity in South India. So the pujari was there, what, and, and the pujari was talking to the deity. So there was this other devotee, he wanted to know, he wanted to know who his guru was. So he, t he asked the pujari to ask the deity. So the deity, he spoke to the deity and the deity told him who the, who the guru, whose guru should be. But then there was another devotee, he also wanted to know. So this time the, the deity said, no, you cannot get a guru because you have not served the devotees yet. When you serve the devotees, then you'll get the Guru. First you have to serve the devotees. So when the devotee heard that, then oh, he was very, very concerned how to serve the devotees. So he was trying to serve devotees and devotees would say, no, 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 don't serve me. No, no, I'm not taking service. No, no, you're a good devotee, you cannot serve me. All the devotees were so humble, they didn't want to take service from him. So he had to go far away. He went far away and he, 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 he found this one place where this one Vaishnava family, they had a farm, they had some cows and he stayed there. He stayed there on the farm secretly and he was taking care of the cows without telling the farmer, without telling the people. He came and he, he stayed there and he cleaned the cows and he, took care of the cow barn <laughs> and then he came back and then the deity said yes now you can get a guru now you serve the devotees so giving service to the devotees very important so madhyama devotees they like that they have a, a service mood they like to do service they like to preach, they like to do kirtan, they like to hear about Krishna and to talk about Krishna. They're always busy in Krishna's service. Kanista is also doing good, he's in the temple, he's worshipping the deity, but, you know, he, he's not so much respectful to devotees yet. He hasn't got a lot of respect to devotees, but gradually, when he sees the Madhyama devotees, when they come, and when he sees these other devotees, when he sees how advanced they are and how they're so blissful and always talking about Krishna, then the Kanista can also become a Madhyam devotee, he can be attracted to the higher level. But on the topmost level, you have these Uttama Adhikari, the Uttama Adhikari or something he's described also as a Maha Bhagavat, great devotee. 
So we're hearing about their vision, right? So the Mahabhagwat or the Uttama Adhikari, they see oneness, right? The Madhyama devotee makes some distinction. But here actually Prabhupada said, Madhyama and Uttama, both of them can correctly see the spiritual position of a living being. So they can see that they're also souls. But the Madhyama, will they behave differently. They each behave differently with these different kinds of devotees. Okay, so then Prabhupada described living entities are qualitatively one. One in quality, but different in quantity. The example was given just that sparks of a fire are qualitatively one with the fire. The spark is one in quality. The spark has heat and light, just like the fire, but different in quantity. So sparks are not equal to the fire and very different in quantity. For the quantity of heat and light, it's not equal. So then the Mahabhagwat devotee sees oneness in the sense that everything is the energy of the Lord. There is no difference between the energy and the energetic. So the energy means the living entities. We are the energy of Krishna, right? The living, we are the energy, part of the energy of Krishna. And Krishna, he is the energetic. He is the energetic. He is the source of the energy, the possessor of the energy. It's his energy. We are his energy. So Prabhupada said, there is no difference. There is the sense of oneness. But then he says, from analytical point of view, heat and light are different from fire. In the fire, there will be heat and light. Heat has one effect, light has another effect. But they're both there with fire. Where there is fire, there will be heat and light. Okay, we'll go ahead. Who's going to read? Next person. Another Prabhu can read. Another man. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare. What's your name, Prabhu? Suryanga Chaitanya. Okay, Prabhu, please read. In this mantra, the words Ekatvam Anupashyata indicate that one should see the unity of all living entities from the viewpoint of the revealed scriptures. The individual sparks of the Supreme Whole possess almost 80% of the known qualities of the whole, but they are not quantitatively equal to the Supreme Lord. These qualities are present in minute quantity, for the living entity is but a minute part and parcel of the Supreme Whole. To use another example, the quantity of salt present in a drop of sea water is never comparable to the quantity of salt present in the complete ocean. But the salt, but the salt present in the, sorry, if the individual uh, living being are equal to the Supreme Lord, both qualitatively and quantitatively, there would be no question of of its being under the influence of the material energy. In the previous mantras, it has already been discussed that no living being, not even the powerful demigods, can surpass the Supreme Being in any respect. Therefore, Ekatvam does not mean that a living being is equal to the Supreme Lord in all respect. It does, however, indicate that in a broader sense, 
there is one interest just as in a family just in sorry just as in a family the interest of all members is one or in the nation the national interest is one although there are many different individual citizens since the living entities are all members of the same supreme family their interest and that of the supreme being are not different every living being is the son of the supreme being as stated in the bhagavad gita all living creatures throughout the universe including birds reptiles ants aquatic trees and so on are emanations of the marginal potency of the supreme lord therefore all of them belong to the family of the supreme being there is no clash of interest thank you prabhu yeah quite a long paragraph there let's go over it again okay so the important term ekatvam anupashyataha ekatvam anupash let's see the word meaning in the mantra how Prabhupada explains it ekatvam oneness in quality Anup anupashyataha of one who sees through authority or one who sees constantly like that so in other words, ekatvam anupashataha means one who always sees everything in quality one with the Lord, right? Sees all living entities in quality one with the Lord, as described there. Ekatvam anupashataha. So, Prabhupada explains, this indicates that one should see the unity, the oneness in quality of all living entities from the viewpoint of the scriptures. You know, in the material world, we have things like United Nations trying to bring all the nations together. <laughs> but there's always so many arguments and wars, threats of fighting and wars going on. And so, United Nations, it, it's really, it's, it's a failure. So, we have to see the oneness of the, the creation from the viewpoint of the scriptures, guided by the scriptures. So not that we're all equal, but one in the sense that quality-wise, different in quantity. Prabhupada explains, just like the individual sparks possess almost 80% of the known qualities of the whole, but they're not quantitatively equal. We have the same qualities, but in different quantity. So this 80% is derived from, if when you study Nectar of Devotion, in the Nectar of Devotion there are a list of some 64 different qualities of Krishna. So Krishna, of course Krishna has unlimited qualities, but for the sake of understanding Krishna, they have described 64 qualities of Krishna. So out of these 64 qualities, the living entities up to Brahma in their most perfect condition, we can have out of the 64 qualities. So 50 out of 60 means almost 80%. So that's where this almost 80% comes from. It's the analysis of these qualities. Because there are certain qualities, there, although there's 64 qualities, we don't have all the qualities. But we can have almost 80% of the qualities. Right? 
and then also we won't have them in the same quantity. So we don't, we're just like little sparks compared to the fire. The fire has so much heat and light. One spark only has a little bit of heat and light. So quality-wise, we have 80, almost 80% 80 of the qualities. And quantity-wise, we're very small compared to Krishna. So these qualities are present in us in minute quantity. Right? We're very small. The living entity is a minute part and parcel of the whole. Remember the size of the spirit soul? How big is the spirit soul? Who knows? What's the dim dimension? One thousand tenth of the head. One tenth. Yeah, one tenth of the tip of the head. So very small, very minute compared to to, and then the other example, the quantity of salt present in a drop of seawater and the quantity of salt in the ocean, a big difference. The salt present in the drop, is, it, it's the same in quality. The salt is the same, but it's in a very different quantity. So this is how we compare to the Lord. The Lord is like the ocean, we're like the tiny drop of water. Therefore, ekatvam does not mean that a living being is equal to the Lord. It does, however, indicate that in a broader sense there is one interest. Just as in a family the interest of the members is one. If the family is united, you know, the sons, and the father, and mother, and sisters, they're, they're all concerned with the interest of the family. Family, right? They may all be working, you may have a working family. Nowadays women also work, the sons work, the daughters can work. So they're all working to help the family, to benefit the family. So their interest is, is one. They have the common interest. In the same way, Krishna is the Supreme Being. And He is like the Father of all of us. We are all like the children. So we all have to work together, the same interest with the Father. Uh, in the Christian Bible, like that. Uh, Jesus, Jesus said, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So in that, in that sense, Jesus is saying he has a Father. He's saying he's not God. You know, some people try to tell us Jesus is God. But Jesus never said he In fact, he said, when they tried to tell me that he's God, they, they said, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. But that doesn't mean that He is God. That doesn't mean that the Son and the Father are the same. But they have the common interest, they have the same concern. So the same way Jesus said, I and the Father are one, He has the interest, the same concern as the Father. Just like when Krishna comes in this world, He comes to deliver people to help the devotee, to save the devotees, to deliver them. So in the same way, the devotees, the pure devotees, like Prabhupada, they try to deliver all of us. Okay, so then Prabhupada goes on in Bhagavad Gita 7, chapter 5 and 6, Krishna is talking about his different energies and Prabhupada talks Uh -oh. Can you hear me still? Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna? 
Hare Krishna, can you hear me now? Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you now, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, yes. Yeah, we had a little bit technical problem there. Okay, do I, do I have to open the screensaver again? Okay, can see everything? Yes. Yes, yes Maharaj. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Very clear. So, as stated in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is describing as then all the different living entities, the birds, the reptiles, the ants, the aquatics, the trees, so on, they're emanations of the marginal potency of the Lord. Remember, we talked there's the internal potency, the external potency, and the marginal potency. The internal potency is the spiritual potency. External is the material potency and the marginal potency is the living entities. So all of them belong to the family of the Supreme Being. No clash of interest. Right? We, we were talking, my dear brother tree, my dear sister flower, we want to see all living entities like that. Our brothers and sisters, we're all one family. We have a common interest. Is it clear? Any questions? Any comments? Yes, Maharaj. I want to ask one question, Maharaj. Yes, uh, please, Prabhu. Uh, is the type of uh, all oneness and brotherhoods and all these things also exist in the other religions like Christianity and Islam. So can we accept the, the Quran and the Bible as a revealed scriptures? Oh yes, we do accept them as revealed scriptures. But, okay, but the, we, we explain that we get more information in our own scriptures than what they actually tend to give. Just like uh, in the Bible, we don't get a lot of detailed information about God and the Kingdom of God. If you go to the Christians and you ask them, they don't know because it's not really in their theology. They don't know about God or the Kingdom of God. If you ask them, what's it like there, what do you do there? I have no idea. So, it, it, it is scripture, it's revealed scripture, but it, the comparison is given just like you have a pocket dictionary and you have the complete dictionary. In the pocket dictionary, you get a very simple information, only a very brief information about the word and its meaning. But in the big dictionary, you get a very good detailed description, you get sentences with the word in, and you, the word is broken into parts to tell you the meaning of each part, the suffix and the prefix and so on. You get the different forms, the adjective form and the verb form, and so many words which come from the, which are derived from the one word. So you get all that in the complete dictionary, but you don't get it in the pocket dictionary. So the, the scriptures, like what the other people have, very limited. Even in the Christian Bible, in the Christian Bible, Jesus himself said, there's so much more I can tell you, but you're not ready to receive it. It's stated like that. There's so much, he said, there's so much more I could tell you, but you're not ready to receive it. But we see Bhagavad Gita, we see Raja Vidya, the king of knowledge, knowledge which is meant for kings. We get so much information is there. Not only Bhagavad, and Bhagavad Gita is only the beginning, that's like ABC. You can go on to the Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charita. We have graduate study, postgraduate study. Everything is described in detail. For example, you look at creation, how it's described in the Bible. It's described there was a burning bush and uh, you know, God moved the clouds around and there, there was a burning bush 
like that. They, they, they don't give much information about how the creation came, how God, they say God created the world in seven days and nights. How did he do it? There's no information. But if you study Srimad Bhagavatam, you get a lot of information. How everything came about, how the different living entities are created, and the different elements of material nature, how it all comes into existence. It's all described in detail. So we're not against other religions, we're not against other scriptures. We accept the absolute truth is there in all the scriptures. There's only one God, but he has many names. You see, that's what we say. We are, we are monotheists. We believe in one God, but God has many names. Now some people call God Allah, some call him Jehovah. And some may call him as Buddha. There are different names for God. We, we call God Krishna and Govinda. Actually, God has no name, but he's known by his qualities. And these names like Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, they're all describing different qualities of God. Just like Krishna means all attractive. So, we're not against other religious traditions. We are, we are open-minded, you know. We don't say we are the only way. Some people do that. We often hear this coming from Christianity. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the light. No man cometh unto God the Father except by me. Okay, that's their philosophy. But we have also, we have also our teachings. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Any other questions? Anyone? No questions? If you like, you can type them in or you can, you can speak. If you don't like to speak, you can type it up and put it on the chat. Okay, we'll go ahead. Spiritual entities. Who can read now? Madhaji, one Madhaji. Who is this? What's your name? Nandini. Nandini? Nandini. Okay, yes, go ahead. The spiritual entities are meant for enjoyment, as stated in the Vedanta Sutra. Ananda Mayu Vyasan. By nature and constitution, every living being, including the Supreme Lord and each of it, his part and parcels is meant for eternal enjoyment. The living beings who are encaged, encaged in the material are constantly seeking enjoyment, but they are seeking it on the wrong platform. Apart from the material platform is the spiritual platform, where the Supreme Being enjoys himself with his innumerable associates. On that platform, there is no trace of material qualities, and therefore, that platform is called Nirguna. On the Nirguna platform, there is never a clash over the object of enjoyment. Here in the material world, there is always a clash between different individual beings because here the proper center of enjoyment is missed. The real center of enjoyment is the Supreme Lord, who is the center of the sublime and spiritual rasa dance. We are all meant to join in and enjoy life with one transcendental interest and without any clash. That is the highest platform of spiritual interest, and as soon as one realizes, this perfect form of oneness, there can be no question of illusion, moha, or lamentation, shoka. Thank you, Nantini. Yes. Okay, let's see what Srila Prabhupada has been saying. He says, the spiritual entities are all meant for enjoyment. We all want to enjoy, right? Just like last night. 
the, the, we, we heard from the devotee, she, she was saying that sometimes people say to her, go and enjoy yourself, go and enjoy, why don't you go and enjoy? Now, <laughs> right, we only live once, go and enjoy. Well, we, it's not wrong to want to enjoy, that's all right. We also want to enjoy. Every living entity is looking for enjoyment. Everyone, all creatures, all the plants, the insects, the birds, they all want to enjoy. Why? Who can say, why do we want to enjoy? Anybody? Any ideas? Because Krishna is the supreme enjoyer, so we as the part and parcel of the supreme, we as the tendency to enjoy as well. Oh, very good, yes. Yes. The spirit soul's nature is to enjoy. Because, as, as you say, we are part and parcel of Krishna. And Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. He enjoys. We also want to enjoy. But what's the problem? Are we enjoying? Why not? Because we try to enjoy uh, Krishna. <laughs> well, not, not exactly. What are we trying to do? We are trying to enjoy on the wrong platform. Right? We are looking for the enjoyment on the bodily platform. Right? So how do we enjoy on the body? What do we do? We try to enjoy to our senses. Yes, what do the senses do? What do you do with your senses? What are the four, four activities? Eating, sleeping, eating and defending. Right. That's our enjoyment. Everyone, we're all trying to enjoy through these things. People going at night, driving in their cars, where are they going? They're going to eat, they're going to drink, they're going to sleep, they're going to mate, like that. These things, that's, they're looking for pleasure. Now, it's not wrong to look, look for pleasure, but they're trying to find the pleasure in the wrong way. It's like you want to get some water, you don't go to the desert when you want some water, when you're thirsty. Why go to the desert? You have to get water in the proper place. So this is a problem. People are trying to enjoy in the wrong way. They're looking for the pleasure on the platform of the body. But we're not the body. We give the example, you take a fish, out of water, right? You take a fish out of water and you put it in the hotel and you give it a nice room in the hotel, you give it air conditioning and you give it cigars and you bring some food and drinks, bring a beautiful girl and everything, will the fish be happy? The fish will say, just put me back in the sea. Just let me get back in the sea. The same way, we're trying to enjoy, we're making many arrangements trying to enjoy this body. But the enjoyment is very less, it's very limited, very small and very temporary. I don't know, I, I try to enjoy. I couldn't find happiness out there. I don't know, if you can find happiness, you're better than me. I couldn't see any happiness out there. And I see, I found a lot of other people also disappointed, unable to find happiness. I was, I was giving class this morning and one young lady, she's a doctor in Delhi, and she was taking the course 
And she was telling me also the same thing, that she was trying to, be, to get happiness and she was trying to please her mother and father. You know, she studied medicine, she became a doctor and everything. So, but what was the happiness? The happiness was so insignificant. The happiness, she said, was like a drop of water in the desert. You know, just like today's Ekadasi, if you're fasting, if you're doing maybe even near job, and we give you a drop of water, we give you the Akman, the Akshman cup, and you sip that you sip the Akshman, or you take some Charanamrita, you take a few drops of Charanamrita, does that quench your thirst? Does that make us feel relief? No. So material happiness is like that. It's so small, it's so limited, it's so temporary, and, it, and it's so difficult to get even that little bit of happiness from the material world. It's such a struggle to get that little happiness. But on the spiritual platform, it's very quick and immediate very easy and we can feel also immediately that how satisfying, how pleasing it is. So this is the difference, the, the material platform and the spiritual platform. We are, we are spiritual beings, we're not bodies. You try to make the body happy just like you know, you, you have a jacket or you have some nice dress. You want to make the dress happy. <laughs> you know, how do you make the dress happy? What do you do to make your jacket happy? It's ridiculous. So, there's a, the point is, we have to understand who we are. We're all souls. And we have to come to that spiritual platform. So Prabhupada says, on that platform there's no trace of material qualities, therefore it's called nirguna. Mm. So everyone is happy there on that platform. Never a clash over the object of enjoyment. See, in the material life we're always fighting over the objects of enjoyment. If there's some money, even a small amount of money, people will fight over it, they'll argue over it. If someone dies in the family and they leave some money, all the family will argue over it. I should get it, I should get it, it's for me. You know, they'll, they'll all argue and fight over it. So material world is like that. So many problems, so many clashes, so many fights going on different feelings. Why? Because we have not got the real center. Who should be in the center? Who should be in the center? Krishna. Yes. Krishna is Krishna. Yeah, so the real ce the center is Krishna. Krishna. Yeah, the center. When Krishna is in the center, then Prabhupada said, he, this is sublime, this is the spiritual rasa dance. We can take part in Krishna's party, the rasa dance. And we can join him and enjoy life there. Krishna expands himself to keep all the gopis happy. All the gopis are happy dancing with Krishna, no clash. So that is the highest platform. As soon as one realizes this perfect form of oneness, there can be no question of illusion or lamentation. The material world is all like that. It's all lament lamenting. I didn't get, he got, I didn't get an illusion. What, what, I, what I want to get, what I should get. Oh, so many problems. Okay, we'll go ahead.
Next person can read. How about Madhuri Tulsi Maharaji, are you here today? Yes, Maharaj, I'm here. Oh, good. Can you read for us again, please? But I don't know where you stopped. I'm sorry. <laughs> a, a, godless civil, a godless civilization arises from God. illusion. Oh, okay, sure. A godless civilization arises from illusion, and the result of such a civilization is lamentation. A godless civilization such as that sponsored by the modern politicians, is always full of anxieties because it may be crushed at any moment. That is the law of nature. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 14, no one but those who surrender at the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord can surpass the stringent laws of nature. Thus, if we wish to get rid of all sorts of illusion, and anxiety and create unity out of all diverse interests, we must bring God into all our activities. Thank you. Okay, so Prabhupada is describing the important point here, that we must, the center of all of our activities should be, we should recognize that there's God, there's the Supreme Lord. Now, some people don't believe in God. They say, oh, come on, what, where is this God? What are we going to say? Have you got any arguments to prove the existence of God? Madhuri Tausi Maharaji, what do you say to people like that? No, look, I don't believe in God. You never saw God. Why you believe in Him? Yeah, we can tell them the, how the planets and uh, everything, the universe is arranged so nicely. You know, we can prove that to them. Okay. Yeah. 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 Some, per some perfection in Krishna's creations. Yeah. How do you see the... Where is the perfection? Just the planets rotating only? Uh, so many things. Uh, for example, in science, Maharaj, we can see that like uh, for respiration, we use oxygen and we give out carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide is used by the plants and they give out oxygen. It's like a cycle. Which is a, a beautiful arrangement of the Lord yeah, very, for our sustenance. Very good, yes. <laughs> very nice. Nice, so many nice examples. Good. Yes, we see everything is provided. Nice arrangements. We breathe out something else, and the, the trees breathe it, take it in, and breathe out something else. Okay, very good. Anybody else like to say anything? How do you how do you convince people about God? What do you do? Just like you know, you have a car. Remember the story about uh, is it Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton, and he believed in God. And he had a friend who didn't believe in God. So one day, this Isaac Newton, he, he built a model of the universe. And so when his friend came and saw the model, he said, oh, this is very nice. And then he said, who made it? What did Isaac Newton say? What did he say? What did Isaac Newton say? His friend said, who made this? So Isaac Newton said? It came by chance. Huh? It came by chance. Said, oh, he said it came by chance, did he? <laughs> well, what did his friend say then? 
come on, definitely somebody has done this. Okay. So then Isaac Newton said what? No, 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 it came by chance. It just appeared. <laughs> yeah, Isaac Newton said, well, if somebody must have made it, somebody also must have made this universe, the big scale model of the universe. They said, I, I made the small model, and some, some greater intelligent being made the big universe. Somebody made it, right? Somebody made, you know, the, you know, the laptop, somebody made the mobile phone, somebody built the house. Where did the house come from? Somebody built it. You know, if we say, just look at Kuala Lumpur, nice city with roads and transportation, electricity supply, so many things, so many features available there in the city. Who made it? We say, oh, we just woke up one morning and there it was, Kuala Lumpur, Haribo. Or maybe we say there was a big bang in the night and we woke up in the morning after the big bang and Kuala Lumpur was there. Right? Of course it's ridiculous. We know there were some intelligent people who got together and who planned everything, organized everything for the, the whole arrangement for the, the organization of the city. And so in the same way, on the big scale, behind the universe, there were some intelligent beings who arranged everything, who organized everything. So there's no, there's no such thing as chance. That is illusion. People say, oh, it's just chance. Where is, what chance? There is no such thing as chance. There's a reason behind everything. So we have to, we have to understand these things. So Prabhupada is pointing out, if, there's, if it's a godless civilization, then there's just going to be anxiety all the time. There's just anxiety because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know where we're going to go. There's so, it's so unstable, unpredictable. You know, you don't know anything. We don't know what to do. We, we don't know who to turn to. But when we have a God-conscious society, then the people can be actually peaceful and they can be happy. So Prabhupada said, if we want to get rid of this illusion and anxiety, there has to be this unity of all our different interests. We have to bring God, we have to bring Krishna into the center of all of our activities. Very important. This mood, this creating a harmonious atmosphere, unity of all the different interests. Somebody said, somebody's interest is in farming, somebody's interest is in uh, business, somebody's interest is in uh, politics. All different interests are there, but the center of all of these things has to be Krishna. There has to be God in the center. Without God consciousness, then it's just animal consciousness. The animals are always in anxiety. They're always afraid. When somebody coming to kill me? That's the material world. We'll go ahead. Next person, the results. Who, who would like to read? Uh, uh, I would like to read Maharaj. Me? Me? The results, the results of our activities must be used to serve the interests of the Lord and not for any other purpose. 
only by serving the Lord's interest can we perceive the Atma Buddha interest mentioned herein. The Atma Buddha interest mentioned in this mantra and the Brahma Buddha interest mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita are one and the same. The Supreme Atma also is the Lord Himself and the Minor Atma is the living entity. The Supreme Atma or Para-Atma alone maintains all the individual minor beings. For the Supreme Lord wants to derive pleasure out of their affection. The Father extends himself through his children and maintains them in order to derive pleasure. If the children obey the Father's will, family affairs will run smoothly with one interest and a pleasing atmosphere. The same situation is transcendently arranged in the absolute family of the Parabrahman, the Supreme Spirit. Okay. So what's Prabhupada saying here? Uh, that if every... All, the Back online. Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Purus. Yeah, we had a problem with the power here. Okay, we were talking about this uh, serving the Lord's interests. Our duty. We're one family. The Lord is like the Father, we're the children, so the common interest is there. And Prabhupada brings up these Sanskrit words, Atma Bhutta and Brahma Bhutta, one, meaning we're one. The, you see, the Lord is Brahman, He is Brahman, He is Parabrahman, mentioned at the end here, mentioned at the end, Parabrahman, right? The same situation is transcendentally arranged in the absolute family of the Parabrahman, the Supreme Spirit. So the Lord is, is the Supreme Spirit and we are the Brahman. We are tiny parts of the Brahman. You see, we are small like the sparks of the fire or like the drop of water from the ocean. So we are one. But at the same time, we're, oh, it says here, one and the same. The interest is one and the same. So the soul, the Lord Himself, and the minute Atma, the living entity, the Supreme Atma or Paramatma, maintains all the minute, all the individual beings. So that one Supreme Lord, Paramatma, He's in the hearts of everyone, maintaining everyone. He wants to derive pleasure from our love, from our affection. Just like the father and mother, they enjoy the love of their children. Through the children, they get pleasure. Why do mother and father, parents have children? Because they get pleasure from the children. And when the children obey the father's instructions and work together cooperatively, then family is very happy and peaceful. One interest, a pleasing atmosphere, so nice. So the same situation is there in relation to Krishna. When we all live together and work together nicely here in this world, then there will be no problems if we have the common interest to serve Krishna.
Okay. So we'll just have we have to finish here. The, the, this last par is it the last paragraph? Yeah. Last paragraph. Who would like to read? Maybe Kundal Kundalata Mataji, Kundalata Radha. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please Thank you, Maharaj. The Parabrahman is a such is as much a person as the individual entities. Neither the Lord nor the living entities are impersonal. Such a transcendental personality are full of transcendental lease, knowledge and life eternal. That is the real position of the spirit, spiritual existence and as soon as one is fully cognizant of this transcendental position, he at once surrender unto the lotus feet of the Supreme Being, Sri Krishna. But such a Mahatma or great soul is very rarely seen because such a transcendental realization is achieved only after many, many births, one is attained. However, there is no longer any illusion or lamentation or the miseries of material accidents of birth and death, which are all experienced in our present life. That is the information information we get from this mantra of Sri Isopanis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kundalata Radha Mataji. Oh, <laughs> okay, so wait, let me go back here. So the Parabrahman is a person. Krishna is a person, right? The Supreme Lord is a person, just as we are persons. But we are very tiny, we are very small and insignificant. He's very great. So neither the Lord and the living entities are impersonal. Of course, Krishna, we could say, well, he is. He's both personal and impersonal. Such personalities are full of eternity, knowledge and bliss. Satchidananda, right? This is the real position of spiritual existence. As soon as one is fully, as soon as we know about this spiritual position, then we surrender. We hear about, when we hear about the spiritual world and we hear about the relationship with Krishna and the pleasure that devotees get, we want it because we want to enjoy. So we surrender to Krishna. And, but Prabhupada then goes on, Prabhupada quotes from the Bhagavad Gita and says, such a Mahatma is very rare. In the Bhagavad Gita, there's a verse, after many births and deaths, Bahunam Janmanamante Jnana Vamma Prapadyante Vasudev Sarvamiti Sa Mahatma Sudurlabha. Prabhupada is paraphrasing that sloka here. He said, Mahatmas are very rarely seen. They have to, it, it takes them many births to come to that position. After many births, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders to Krishna. Such a soul is very rare. And so we're not following that process. That's the path of knowledge. Takes many lifetimes, but we can immediately surrender to Krishna very quickly. We don't need to wait many, many lifetimes. We can surrender in this lifetime now. And from this life, we can go back to Godhead. This can be our last life in the material world. We can go back to Godhead at the end of this life. Um, why should we want to go back to Godhead? Because there's no illusion, no lamentation, no miseries, no unemployment, right? No redundancy, no viruses, none of these things which we experience here in this material world. So we should want to get out of this material world and go back to Godhead. This is the teaching of this mantra, right? So any questions on this mantra, anybody? Is Jolene here tonight? 
Yes, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I am here. Have you got some questions for us tonight? Um, I, I do actually, um, but it's rather a, a comment and I hope I don't get judged for it. <laughs> I, I find that um, the recent events with um, uh, Bhakti Sharun Maharaj has been uh, uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, a, quite an impact to a lot of us. So I think that um, if I see it in the material platform, I'll definitely be very sad. But if I see, try to look at the situation in this, to, to understand that um, Krishna can do anything that he wants, and I'll start to learn that, you know, uh, to surrender to his decisions, then it would uh, be more comforting. Yeah, that, that's actually what we, ha we all have to do. We have to just surrender to Krishna.